Book One of The Civil Wars by Appian of Alexandria, taken from the Histories. Translated by Horace White and published in the Loeb Classical Library, 1913. Part One The Romans, as they subdued the Italian people successively in war, used to seize a part of their lands and build towns there, or enroll colonists of their own to occupy those already existing, and their idea was to use these outposts, but of the land acquired, by war they assigned the cultivated part forthwith to the colonists, or sold or leased it. Since they had no leisure yet to allot the part which then lay desolated by war, this was generally the greater part, they made proclamation that in the meantime those who were willing to work it might do so for a toll of the yearly crops, a tenth of the grain and a fifth of the fruit. From those who kept flocks was required a toll of the animals, both oxen and small cattle. They did these things in order to multiply the Italian race, which they considered the most laborious of peoples, so that they might have plenty of allies at home. But the very opposite thing happened. For the rich, getting possession of the greater part of the undistributed lands, and being emboldened by the lapse of time to believe that they would never be dispossessed, absorbing any adjacent strips and their poor neighbors' allotments, partly by purchase under persuasion and partly by force, came to cultivate vast tracts instead of single estates, using slaves as laborers and herdsmen, lest free laborers should be drawn from agriculture into the army. At the same time, the ownership of slaves brought them great gain from the multitude of their progeny, who increased because they were exempt from military service. Thus, certain powerful men became extremely rich, and the race of slaves multiplied throughout the country, while the Italian people dwindled in numbers and strength, being oppressed by punery, taxes, and military service. If they had any respite from these evils, they passed their time in idleness, because the land was held by the rich, who employed slaves instead of free men as cultivators. For these reasons, the people became troubled lest they should no longer have sufficient allies of the Italian stock, and lest the government itself should be endangered by such a vast number of slaves. As they did not perceive any remedy, for it was not easy, nor in any way just, to deprive men of so many possessions they had held so long, including their own trees, buildings, and fixtures, a law was at last passed with difficulty at the instance of the tribunes, that nobody should hold more than five hundred yugera of this land, or pasture on it more than a hundred cattle or five hundred sheep. To ensure the observance of this law, it was provided also that there should be a certain number of free men employed on the farms, whose business it should be to watch and report what is going on. Having thus comprehended all this in the law, they took an oath over and above the law and fixed penalties for violating it, and it was supposed that the remaining land would soon be divided among the poor in small parcels. But there was not the smallest consideration shown for the law or the oaths. The few who seemed to pay some respect to them conveyed their lands to their relations fraudulently, but the greater part disregarded it altogether, till at last Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus, an illustrious man, eager for glory, a most powerful speaker, and, for these reasons well known to all, delivered an eloquent discourse, while serving as tribune concerning the Italian race. Lamenting that a people so valiant in war, and related in blood to the Romans, were declining little by little into pauperism and paucity of numbers without any hope of remedy, he inveighed against a multitude of slaves as useless in war and never faithful to their masters, and adduced the recent calamity brought upon the masters by their slaves in Sicily, where the demands of agriculture had greatly increased the number of the latter, recalling also the war waged against them by the Romans, which was not either easy nor short, but long protracted and full of vicissitudes and dangers, after speaking thus, he again brought forward the law, providing that nobody should hold more than 500 yugera of the public domain. But he added a provision to the former law, that the sons of the occupiers might each hold one half of that amount, and that the remainder should be divided among the poor by three elected commissioners, who should be changed annually. This was extremely disturbing to the rich, because, on account of the triumvirs, they could no longer disregard the law as they had done before, 
nor could they buy the allotment of others, because Gracchus had provided against this by forbidding sales. They collected together in groups, and made lamentation, and accused the poor of appropriating the results of their tillage, their vineyards, and their dwellings. Some said that they had paid the price of the land to their neighbors. Were they to lose the money with their land? Others said that their graves of their ancestors were in the ground, which had been allotted to them in the division of their father's estates. Others said that their wives' dowries had been expended on the estates, or that the land had been given to their own daughters as a dowry. Moneylenders could show loans made on the security. All kinds of wailing and expressions of indignation were heard at once. On the other side were heard the lamentations of the poor, that they were being reduced from competence to extreme punery, and from that to childlessness, because they were unable to rear their offspring. They recounted the military services they had rendered, by which this very land had been acquired, and were angry that they should be robbed of their share of the common property. They reproached the rich for employing slaves, who were always faithless and ill-disposed, and for that reason unserviceable in war, instead of freemen, citizens, and soldiers. While these classes were thus lamenting and indulging in mutual accusations, a great number of others, composed of colonists or inhabitants of free towns, or persons otherwise interested in the lands and who were under like apprehensions, flocked in and took sides with their respective factions. Emboldened by numbers and exasperated against each other, they kindled considerable disturbances and waited eagerly for the voting on the new law, some intending to prevent its enactment by all means, and others to enact it at all costs. In addition to personal interest, the spirit of rivalry spurred both sides in the preparations they were making against each other for the appointed day. What Gracchus had in his mind in proposing the measure was not money, but men, inspired greatly by the usefulness of the work and believing that nothing more advantageous or admirable could ever happen to Italy, he took no account of the difficulty surrounding it. When the time for voting came, he advanced many arguments at considerable length and also asked them whether it was not just to let the commons divide the common property, whether a citizen was not worthy of more consideration at all times than a slave, whether a man who served in the army was not more useful than one who did not, and whether one who had a share in the country was not more likely to be devoted to the public interests. He did not dwell long on this comparison between freemen and slaves, which he considered degrading, but proceeded at once to a review of their hopes and fears for the country, saying that the Romans possessed most of their territory by conquest, that they had hopes of occupying the rest of the habitable world. But now the question of great hazard was whether they should gain the rest by having plenty of brave men, or whether, through their weakness and mutual jealousy, their enemies should take away what they had already possessed. After exaggerating the glory and riches on the one side and the danger and fear on the other, he admonished the rich to take heed, and said that for the realization of these hopes they ought to bestow this very land as a free gift, if necessary, on men who would rear children, and not, by contending about small things, overlook larger ones, especially since for any labor they had spent they were receiving ample compensation in the undisputed title to 500 Ugera each of free land in a high state of cultivation, without cost, and half as much more for each son in the case of those who had sons. After saying much more to the same purpose, and exciting the poor, as well as others who were moved by reason rather than by desire for gain, he ordered the clerk to read the proposed law. Marcus Octavius, however, another tribune who had been induced by those in possession of the lands to interpose his veto, for among the Romans the negative veto always defeats an affirmative proposal, ordered the clerk to keep silence. Thereupon Gracchus reproached him severely and adjoined the comitia to the following day. Then he stationed near himself a sufficient guard, as if to force Octavius against his will, and ordered the clerk with threats to read the proposed law to the multitude. He began to read, but when Octavius again forbade, he stopped. Then the tribunes fell to wrangling with each other, and considerable tumult arose among the people. The leading citizens besought the tribunes to submit their controversy to the Senate for decision. Gracchus seized on the suggestion, believing that the law was acceptable to all well-disposed persons, and hastened to the Senate House. But, as he had only a few followers there, and was upbraided by the rich, he ran back to the forum, 
and said that he would take the vote at the Comitia on the following day, both on the law and on the official rights of Octavius to determine whether a tribune who was acting contrary to the people's interest could continue to hold office. And this Gracchus did, for when Octavius, nothing daunted, again interposed, Gracchus proposed to take the vote on him first. When the first tribe voted to abrogate the magistracy of Octavius, Gracchus turned to him and begged him to desist from his veto. As he would not yield, he took the votes of other tribes. There were 35 tribes at that time. The 17 that voted first passionately supported the motion. If the 18 should do the same, it would make a majority. Again did Gracchus, in the sight of the people, urgently importune Octavius in his present danger not to prevent a work which was most righteous and useful to all Italy, and not to frustrate the wishes so earnestly entertained by the people, whose desires he ought rather to share in his character of tribune, and not to risk the loss of his office by public condemnation. After speaking thus, he called the gods to witness that he did not willingly do any despite to his colleague. As Octavius was still unyielding, he went on taking the vote. Octavius was forthwith reduced to the rank of a private citizen and slunk away unobserved. Quintus Mummius was chosen tribune in his place, and the agrarian law was enacted. The first triumvirs appointed to divide the land were Gracchus himself. The proposer of the law, his brother of the same name, and his father-in-law, Appius Claudius, since the people still feared that the law might fail of execution unless Gracchus should take the lead with his whole family. Gracchus became immensely popular by reason of the law and was escorted at home by the multitude as though he were the founder not of a single city or race, but of all the nations of Italy. After this victorious party returned to the fields from which they had come to attend to his business, the defeated ones remained in the city and talked the matter over, feeling aggrieved and saying that as soon as Gracchus should become a private citizen, he would be sorry that he had done despite to the sacred and inviolable office of tribune, and had sown in Italy so many seeds of future strife. Part 2 It was now summer, and the election of tribunes was imminent. As the day for voting approached, it was very evident that the rich had earnestly promoted the election of those most inimical to Gracchus, the latter, fearing that evil would befall if he should not be re-elected for the following year, summoned his friends from the fields to attend the election. But as they were occupied with harvest, he was obliged, when the day fixed for the voting drew near, to have recourse to the plebeians of the city. So he went around asking each one separately to elect him tribune for the ensuing year, and on account of the danger he was incurring for them. When the voting took place, the first two tribes pronounced for Gracchus. The rich objected that it was not lawful for the same man to hold the office twice in succession. The tribune Rubrius, who had been chosen by lot to preside over the comitia, was in doubt about it, and Mumius, who had been chosen in place of Octavius, urged him to hand over the comitia to his charge. This he did, but the remaining tribunes contended that the presidency should be decided by lot, saying that when Rubrius, who had been chosen in that way, resigned, the casting of lots ought to be done over again by all. As there was much strife over this question, Gracchus, who was getting the worst of it, adjourned the voting to the following day. In utter despair, he went about in black, though still in office, and led his son around the forum, and introduced him to each man, and committed him to their charge, as if he himself felt that death at the hands of his enemies were at hand. The poor, when they had time to think, were moved with deep sorrow, both on their own account, for they believed that they were no longer to live in a free estate under equal laws, but would be reduced to servitude by the rich, and on account of Gracchus himself, who was in such fear and torment in their behalf. So they all accompanied him with tears to his house in the evening, and bade him be of good courage for the morrow. Gracchus cheered up, assembled his partisans before daybreak, and communicated to them a signal to be displayed if there were need for fighting. He then took the possession of the temple on the Capitoline Hill, where the voting was to take place, and occupied the middle of the assembly. As he was obstructed by the other tribunes and by the rich, who would not allow the votes to be taken on this question, he gave the signal. There was a sudden shout from those who knew of it, and violence followed. 
Some of the partisans of Gracchus took position around him like bodyguards. Others, having girded up their clothes, seized the fasces and staves in the hands of the lictors and broke them in pieces. They drove the rich out of the assembly with such disorder and wounds that the tribunes fled from their places in terror, and the priests closed the doors of the temple. Many ran away pell-mell and scattered wild rumors. Some said that Gracchus had deposed all of the other tribunes, and this was believed because none of them could be seen. Others said that he had declared himself tribune for the ensuing year without an election. If these circumstances the Senate assembled at the Temple of Fides, it is astonishing to me that they never thought of appointing a dictator in this emergency, although they had often been protected by the government of a single ruler in such times of peril, but a resource which had been found most useful in former times was never even recollected by the people, either then or later, after reaching such a decision as they did reach. They marched up to the capital, Cornelius Scipio Nasica, the Pontifex Maximus, leading the way and calling out with a loud voice, Let those who would save our country follow me. He wound the border of his toga about his head, either to induce a great number to go with him by the singularity of his appearance, or to make for himself, as it were, a helmet as a sign of battle for those who saw it or in order to conceal himself from the gods on account of what he was about to do. When he arrived at the temple and advanced against the partisans of Gracchus, they yielded out of regard for so excellent a citizen, and because they observed the senators following with him. The latter, wresting their clubs out of the hands of the Gracchans themselves, or breaking up benches and other furniture that had been brought for the use of the assembly, began beating them, and pursued them, and drove them over the precipice. In the tumult, many of the Gracchans perished, and Gracchus himself, vainly circling round the temple, was slain at the door closed by the statues of the kings. All the bodies were thrown by night into the Tiber. So perished on the capital, and while still tribune Gracchus, the son of that Gracchus who was twice consul, and of Cornelia, daughter of that Scipio who robbed Carthage of her supremacy, he lost his life in consequence of a most excellent design, which, however, he pursued in too violent a manner. This shocking affair, the first, was perpetrated in the public assembly, was seldom without parallels thereafter from time to time. On the subject of the murder of Gracchus, the city was divided between sorrow and joy. Some mourned for themselves and for him, and deplored the present condition of things, believing that the commonwealth no longer existed but had been supplanted by force and violence. Others considered that everything had turned out for them exactly as they wished. These things took place at the time when Aristonicus was contending with the Romans for the government of Asia. Part 3 After Gracchus was slain and Appius Claudius died, Fulvius Flaccus and Papirius Carbo were appointed, in conjunction with the younger Gracchus, to divide the land. As the persons in possession neglected to hand in lists of their holdings, a proclamation was issued that the informers should furnish testimony against them. Immediately a great number of embarrassing lawsuits sprang up. Wherever a new field adjoining an old one had been bought or divided among the allies, the whole district had to be carefully inquired into on account of the measurement of this one field, to discover how it had been sold and how it divided. Not all owners had preserved their contracts or their allotment titles, and even those that were found were often ambiguous. When the land was resurveyed, some owners were obliged to give up their fruit trees and farm buildings in exchange for naked ground. Others were transferred from cultivated to uncultivated lands, or to swamps or pools. In fact, the land having originally been so much loot, the survey had never been carefully done. As the original proclamation authorized anybody to work the undistributed land who wished to do so, many had been prompted to cultivate the parts immediately adjoining their own, till the line of demarcation between public and private land had faded from view. The progress of time also made many changes. Thus the injustice done by the rich, although great, was not easy to ascertain. So there was nothing but a general turnabout, all parties being moved out of their own places and settling down in other people's. The Italian allies, who complained of these disturbances, and especially of the lawsuits hastily brought against them, chose Cornelius Scipio, the destroyer of Carthage, to defend them against these grievances. As he had availed himself of their zealous support in war, he was reluctant to disregard their request. 
So he came into the Senate, and although out of regard for the plebeians, he did not openly find fault with the law of Gracchus, he expatiated on its difficulties, and urged that these causes should not be decided by the triumvirs, because they did not possess the confidence of the litigants, but should be assigned to other courts. As his views seemed reasonable, they yielded to his persuasion, and the consul Tuditanus was appointed to give judgment in these cases. But when he took up the work, he saw the difficulties of it, and marched against the Illyrians as a pretext for not acting as judge, and since nobody brought cases for trial before the triumvirs, they remained idle. From this cause, hatred and indignation arose among the people against Scipio because they saw a man, in whose favor they had often opposed the aristocracy and incurred their enmity, electing him consul twice contrary to law, now taking the side of the Italian allies against themselves. When Scipio's enemies observed this, they cried out that he was determined to abolish the law of Gracchus utterly, and for that end was about to inaugurate armed strife and bloodshed. When the people heard these charges, they were in a state of alarm until Scipio, after placing near his couch at home one evening a tablet on which to write during the night the speech he intended to deliver before the people, was found dead in his bed without a wound. Whether this was done by Cornelia, the mother of the Gracchi, aided by her daughter Sempronia, who though married to Scipio, was both unloved and unloving because she was deformed and childless, lest the law of Gracchus should be abolished, or whether, as some think, he committed suicide because he saw plainly that he could not accomplish what he had promised, is not known. Some say that slaves under torture testified that unknown persons were introduced through the rear of the house by night who suffocated him that those who knew about it hesitated to tell because the people were angry with him still and rejoiced at his death. So died Scipio, and although he had been of extreme service to the Roman power, he was not even honored with a public funeral. So much does the anger of the present moment outweigh the gratitude for the past. And this event, sufficiently important in itself, took place as a mere incident of the sedition of Gracchus. Even after these events, those who were in possession of the lands postponed the division on various pretexts for a very long time. Some proposed that all the Italian allies who made the greatest resistance to it should be admitted to Roman citizenship, so that, out of gratitude for the greater favor, they might no longer quarrel about the land. The Italians were ready to accept this, because they preferred Roman citizenship to possession of the fields. Fulvius Flaccus, who was both consul and triumvir, exerted himself to the utmost to bring it about, but the senators were very angry at the thought of making their subjects equal citizens with themselves. For this reason the attempt was abandoned, and the populace, who had been so long in the hope of acquiring land, became disheartened. While they were in the mood, Gaius Gracchus, who had made himself agreeable to them as a triumvir, offered himself for that tribuneship. He was the younger brother of Tiberius Gracchus, the promoter of the law, and had been quite for some time after his brother's death, but since many of the senators treated him scornfully, he announced himself as a candidate for the office of tribune. Being elected with flying colors, he began to lay plots against the senate, and made the unprecedented suggestion that a monthly distribution of corn should be made to each citizen at the public expense. Thus he quickly got the leadership of the people by one political measure in which he had the cooperation of Fulvius Flaccus. Directly after that, he was chosen tribune for the following year, for in cases where there was not a sufficient number of candidates, the law authorized the people to choose further tribunes from the whole body of citizens. Thus Gaius Gracchus was tribune a second time. Having bought the plebeians, as it were, he began, by another like political maneuver, to court the equestrian order, who hold the middle place between the senate and the plebeians. He transferred the courts of justice, which had become discredited by reason of bribery, from the senators to the knights, reproaching the former especially with the recent examples of Aurelius Cota, Salinator, and third in the list, Manius Aquilius, the subduer of Asia, all notorious bribe-takers, who had been acquitted by the judges, although ambassadors sent to complain of their conduct were still present, going around uttering bitter accusations against them. The Senate was extremely ashamed of these things, and yielded to the law, and the people ratified it. In this way were the courts of justice transferred from the Senate to the Knights. It is said that soon after the passage of this law, Gracchus remarked that he had broken the power of the Senate once and for all. And the saying of Gracchus received a deeper and deeper significance by the course of events. 
For this power of sitting in judgment on all Romans and Italians, including the senators themselves, in all matters as to property, civil rights, and banishment, exalted the knights to be rulers over them, and put senators on the level of subjects. Moreover, as the knights voted in the election to sustain the power of the tribunes and obtain from them whatever they wanted in return, they became more and more formidable to the senators. So it shortly came about that the political mastery was turned upside down, the power being in the hands of the knights, and the honor only remaining with the senate. The knights indeed went so far that they had not only power over the senators, but they openly flouted them beyond their right. They also became addicted to bribe-taking, and when they too had tasted these enormous gains, they indulged in them even more basely and immoderately than the senators had done. They suborned accusers against the rich and did away with prosecutions for bribe-taking altogether, partly by agreement among themselves and partly by open violence, so that the practice of this kind of investigation became entirely obsolete. Thus the judiciary law gave rise to another struggle of factions, which lasted a long time and was not less baneful than the former ones. Gracchus also made long roads throughout Italy, and thus put a multitude of contractors and artisans under obligations to him, and made them ready to do whatever he wished. He proposed the founding of numerous colonies. He also called on the Latin allies to demand the full rights of the Roman citizenship. Since the Senate could not with decency refuse this privilege to men who were of the same race. To the other allies who were not allowed to vote in Roman elections, he sought to give the right of suffrage, in order to have their help in the enactment of laws which he had in contemplation. The Senate was very much alarmed at this, and it ordered the consuls to give the following public notice. Nobody who does not possess the right of suffrage shall stay in the city or approach within 40 states of it while voting is going on concerning these laws. The Senate also persuaded Livius Drusus, another tribune, to interpose his veto against the laws proposed by Gracchus, but not to tell the people his reasons for doing so, for a tribune was not required to give reasons for his veto. In order to conciliate the people, they gave Drusus the privilege of founding twelve colonies, and the plebeians were so much pleased with this that they scoffed at the laws proposed by Gracchus. Having lost the favor of the rabble, Gracchus sailed for Africa in company with Fulvius Flaccus, who after his consulship had been chosen tribune for the same reasons as Gracchus himself. It had been decided to send a colony to Africa on account of its reputed fertility, and these men had been expressly chosen the founders of it in order to get them out of the way for a while, so that the Senate might have a respite from demagogism. They marked out the city for the colony on the place where Carthage had formerly stood, disregarding the fact that Scipio, when he destroyed it, had devoted it with solemn imprecations to sheep pasturage forever. They assigned 6,000 colonists to this place, instead of the smaller number fixed by law in order to further to curry favor with the people thereby. When they returned to Rome, they invited the 6,000 from the whole of Italy. The functionaries who were still in Africa, laying out the city, wrote home that wolves had pulled up and scattered the boundary marks made by Gracchus and Fulvius, and the soothsayers consider this an ill omen for the colony. So the Senate summoned the Comitia, in which it was proposed to repeal the law concerning this colony. When Gracchus and Fulvius saw their failure in this matter, they were furious, and declared that the Senate had lied about the wolves. The boldest of the plebeians joined them carrying daggers, and proceeded to the capital where the assembly was to be held in reference to the colony. Now, the people had come together already, and Fulvius had begun speaking about the business in hand when Gracchus arrived at the capital attended by a bodyguard of his partisans. Conscious stricken by what he knew about the extraordinary plans on foot, he turned aside from the meeting place of the assembly, passed into the portico, and walked about waiting to see what would happen. Just then, a plebeian named Antilus, who was sacrificing in the portico, saw him in his disturbed state, laid his hand upon him, either because he had heard or suspected something, or was moved to speak to him for some other reason, and begged him to spare his country. Gracchus, still more disturbed and startled like one detected in a crime, gave the man a sharp look. Then, one of his party, although no signal had been displayed or order given, Inferred merely from the angry glance that Gracchus cast upon Antilus that the time for action had come, and thought that he should do a favor to Gracchus by striking the first blow. So he drew his dagger and slew Antilus. A cry was raised, a dead body was seen in the midst of the crowd, and all who were outside fled from the temple in fear of a like fate. Gracchus went into the assembly desiring to exculpate himself of the deed, but nobody would so much as listen to him. 
all turned away from him as one stained with blood. So both he and Flaccus were at their wit's end, and, having lost thought in this hasty act the chance of accomplishing what they wished, they hastened to their homes and their partisans with them. The rest of the crowd occupied the forum after midnight as though some calamity were impending, and Opimius, the consul who was staying in the city, ordered an armed force to gather in the capital at daybreak, and sent heralds to convoke the senate. He took his own station in the temple of Castor and Pollux in the center of the city, and there awaited events. When these arrangements had been made, the senate summoned Gracchus and Flaccus from their homes to the senate house to defend themselves, but they ran out towards the Aventine Hill, hoping that if they could seize it first, the senate would agree to some terms with them. As they ran throughout the city, they offered freedom to the slaves, but none listened to them. With such forces as they had, however, they occupied and fortified the temple of Diana, and sent Quintus, the son of Flaccus, to the senate, seeking to come to an arrangement and to live in harmony. The senate replied that they should lay down their arms, come to the senate house, and tell them what they wanted, or else send no more messengers. When they sent Quintus a second time, the consul Opimius arrested him as being no longer an ambassador after he had been warned, and, at the same time, sent his armed men against the Gracchans. Gracchus fled across the river by the wooden bridge, with one slave to a grove, and there, being on the point of arrest, he presented his throat to the slave. Flaccus took refuge in the workshop of an acquaintance. As his pursuers did not know which house he was in, they threatened to burn the whole row. The man who had given shelter to Suppliant hesitated to point him out, but directed another man to do so. Flaccus was seized and put to death. The heads of Gracchus and Flaccus were carried to Opimius, and he gave their weight in gold to those who brought them, but the people plundered their houses. Opimius then arrested their fellow conspirators, cast them into prison, and ordered that they should be strangled, but he allowed Quintus, the son of Flaccus, to choose his own mode of death. After this, illustration of the city was performed for the bloodshed, and the Senate ordered the building of a temple to Concord in the Forum.